good evening everyone it is a great pleasure to have in this wonderful evening mr manuel retana from uh, nasa an aerospace engineer joining with us good morning manuel retana for and uh, we would like to thank you for uh, accepting our request first of all and this session is organized together by district science center tirunelveli ministry of culture government of india in association with uh, wings of aero and uh, we have conducted so many series of uh, lectures in the last one week to celebrate world space week so today at the final day of world space week we are having manuel retana i request yagnik barya to give the uh, details about manuel retana So, very good evening to the participants, and a warm good morning to our today's guest, Mr. Manuel, who is joining us straight from California, U.S. And today we have joined with us District Science Officer of Colonial Valley. So, welcome to you too, sir. And I'd like to thank Ministry of Culture and Government of India for supporting the session, and uh, thank you, District Science Center, Colonial Valley. So, on behalf of Thames Era and Wings of Aero, I am very happy to welcome you all to this lecture on robotic technologies to enable space exploration. And before proceeding towards the lecture, I would like to give some introduction about today's speaker, Mr. Manuel. So he has done his schooling from Valley High School and has done his bachelor's in mechanical engineering from University of Nevada. Reno, and after that he secured admission at the uh, one of the prestigious universities, Stanford, where he earned his master's degree in aeronautics and astronautics. And in between that, he has done number of internships, which includes working as liquid propulsion intern at uh, North Northrop Grumman Corporation and propulsion and power pathways intern. At NASA's GSC Center, and he is currently working at NASA's Johnson Space Center as an aerospace engineer. And it's been almost five years for him to work with NASA. So it would be great listening from him. So thanks again, Mr. Manuel, for joining us and and spending your time for for us. Thank you, sir. Over to you. Thank you so much. Uh, I really appreciate it, Jagnik. Um, I I just want you to comment in the chat. Any any of you, if you have uh, uh, issues listening to me, if you cannot hear what I'm saying, um, uh, please comment in the chat. Also, if you're gonna speak today, go ahead. This is a good time. Um, and um, and if not, if you're not speaking, if you could mute yourself, that we can all you know listen to to, to the presentation. Okay, so I'm gonna go ahead. So I'm still getting some people, and I have to give them access to the to the room. So I'm just gonna wait one more minute. Um, but um, okay, let's give it a sec. Well, and we're gonna go ahead um, and start. Give me one second. Make sure that I'm not muted. Perfect. Okay, everybody. So um, my name is Manuel Retana. I am a you know Stanford Space Engineer. I just graduated um, last month, and I'm also uh, this, this is this is old. Uh, I'm actually a, a NASA Aerospace Engineer as well. Um, give me one second. Yeah. Perfect. Yeah, so uh, I'm going to talk about different robotic technologies that, in my perspective, will enable space exploration in the future. Um, and I'm going to move to the next slide. So this is some of my contact information, uh, my LinkedIn and my email. Uh, I'm also on Instagram um, if, if you would like to follow a little bit of my story. But um, I want to uh, start by saying um, I do not represent the views of NASA in this presentation. 
So even though I work for them, I am not uh, explicitly, you know, giving the views of them. This is a personal presentation uh, where I talk a little bit about my research. Uh, if you have any questions, um, please type them in the chat. And I'm going to stop in, in, in sections of the presentation for you, uh, for me to answer them. I'm going to go through them. Okay. Okay. So the first one, I'm going to give you a little bit of my, my background. I think uh, Jagnik already talked about it. So I'm not going to go into much detail. Uh, but uh, yeah, so just got my master's, did my undergrad in mechanical engineering at UNR. Uh, I have done some research at Stanford and, and also uh, at Stanford and also at University of Nevada, Reno. I also got to go to the United Kingdom uh, and did uh, research for Airbus. Um, and then I have worked in several projects. Um, in the past, I used to work in defense with Northrop Grumman in the US Air Force and also nuclear engineering with the National Nuclear Security Administration. Uh, this is a, I, I think a slide I give to everybody. So I, I am actually, my family is Mexican. Um, and I, um, I was, I, I'm a U.S. citizen, but I was, I, I grew up most of my life in Mexico. And this is a picture of me in uh, middle school. Um, and so this is, you know, kind of when the dream has started of me wanting to work at NASA, uh, I, I ended up moving to the United States in, in high school where I finished, uh, when I did some robotics, and after that, my first year of college, um, I got to work in nuclear engineering. Behind me is the B reactor of the Manhattan Project. Uh, and this is a, a one of the first nuclear reactors in the world. Um, and then this is me. This picture is not as, as great. Um, I was uh, working for Northrop Grumman. And be behind me is a missile. It's an intercontinental ballistic missile. But it's just a mock-up. It's not the real one. But it was just to display like the size of, of this type of rockets. Um, and then um, and I went to the United Kingdom. This is London, uh, Big Ben. Um, and after doing research in the UK, I got to join NASA as, a, as an intern, and where I got to meet some, you know, great personalities like um, Gene Kranz. Gene Kranz is one of the legends, and I would say in in, in space flight. He he was the flight director in the mission control room when when um, Apollo 13 suffered the accident, and he was one of the people that led um, the you know, um, saving those three astronauts that were um, stranded in space. Then I got the opportunity to to go to you know, uh, Stanford University, where where I did my masters, and then through throughout um, um, my uh, my time at Stanford, I got to meet uh, one of my heroes, which is Mexican American uh, astronaut Jose Hernandez. I got to meet with him and talk about uh, some things. Uh, you know. I, I got to interview him for like a whole hour. And then we got to today. To today, uh, where, where I'm where I just become a NASA aerospace engineer full time. Uh, but, you know, it's, it's all a journey. There was no straight journey, actually, to NASA. There was a lot of things that, that went through. And so uh, I just want to show that, that, you know, dreams can become true if you really work hard. And, and there's really no straight path. You know, working nuclear engineering, I never thought I, I would end up at NASA. So... Great. So I want to start with uh, the motivation um, of some of my research. I, I do a lot of ro human robot collaboration, and this project is the assistant uh, ro robotic assistant in space uh, project. Um, and some of the motivation uh, is, um, you know, we want to develop. Uh, we would like to see a world where um, we have humans uh, supported by robots on the moon. Uh, for exploration and also lunar base construction. Today, we uh, I, I think I can hear some echo. So um, if, if people could mute themselves, that would be great. Um, and then... Uh, Sorry? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Thank you, sir. Um, yeah, and so uh, another one is uh, uh, another example of what's happening today. Uh, uh, I, I want to refer to Mexico. Uh, two years ago, there was a huge earthquake in, in Mexico City uh, where, um, you know, there was a lot of people that died and a lot of people that uh, were uh, below buildings. Um, and it was pretty risky for, you know, first responders to go inside those buildings because they were, they were about to collapse. And so we would like to use robots in these scenarios where there's a lot of risk, uh, we would like to use um, robots that could go and, and find people or move uh, 
debris. And this is something that, you know, the, uh, Japan, um, a lot of research, research has been, been um, uh, done to, to kind of develop this type of robots. Um, oh, sorry, what happened here? My bad. Great. Sorry. Thank God. Uh, another one is opening uh, a valve in a in a gas leak or a nuclear uh, a, a nuclear um, accident, and this is a DARPA challenge. Um, this is a DARPA challenge that is current, and and this could have, for example, if there's an accident in an oil company or a, in a nuclear reactor, you wouldn't send people because of radiation of the high risk, and so you could send a robot. And then obviously a more futuristic thing that I, we, I think I, see, I foresee in the, in the future. I mean, we're, we're trying this at the moment and we're using robots at the moment in, in places like Amazon to, to deliver packages faster. Um, but we wanna see this in, in industry in the future where you have human robot collaboration in, in warehouses and in the workplace, right? We wanna have a multiple, multiple, um, multiple people um, there and also have robots, but we don't want to replace uh, all, all, all humans with robots. We want to have uh, both in the workplace because robots are very good at repetitive tasks, uh, but uh, humans are good at you know uh, figuring out problems that robots never saw. And so it's good to have both of them in the in in the in the workplace. Um, great. All right. So uh, a little bit of the big the key, key parts of the research. Uh, the first one is uh, we wanna do multi-human intent estimation. What is intent estimation? We want the robot, from the robot perspective, we want the robot to understand what the humans um, are trying to do. And uh, sometimes understanding human intent uh, through observation is not guaranteed because it's not directly observable. observable. You use sensors and sensors are noisy. And so sometimes it is imperfect. And so in our research at Stanford, we're leveraging some of mixed reality as a time effective, that's very important, time effective and intuitive tool for humans to convey intent to a robot. And I'm gonna give you examples of that. The second part of our research has to do with um, machine learning. And we wanna do task process model identification. Uh, and this is essentially modeling techniques that allow us to calculate the task the, the model of the human, the model of the of the robot, and 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 work make them work together to get to accomplish a task. Um, and um, give me one sec. Um, and and some of these tools are, for example, here in micro models, convolutional neural networks, recurrent neural networks, uh, the um, long short term, um, um, and the partial several micro decision processes. Uh, another one is, um, wow, I didn't know this. I didn't know I had a limit. This is crazy. My bad. Okay, so I, th I think we're going to have some issues because uh, we started the meeting early and I'm getting a lot of people and it seems like I don't, I don't have capability for the whole hour. Okay. And then the last one is collaborative level of involvement in task and session. This is when the robot... Um, when the robot uh, gets into the task. So now I calculated what I have to do. Now I understand what the human and the robot are doing. Now, how do I insert my, myself to the task? Well, I'm gonna give you an example. Uh, we are, let's say in the moon, uh, and we have an astronaut that is trying to move an instrument from point A to point B. That's the intention of the human. And you have a robot. And so uh, typically what we do as roboticists is, you know, we call this out. And we, we put the uh, of the robot to indicate you know what what, what we're gonna do, uh, but this is very inefficient. So uh, we were gonna, for example, in the visor of the astronaut helmet, we're gonna put uh, this uh, essentially HoloLens technology, and uh, this HoloLens technology will um, will allow. Us, this is a perspective from, from the view of the astronaut. You have the physical box, you are a hologram, and you place it on top of the box. And then later, put a and it's the spacecraft also on the word, right? So again, we go with the glasses 
we add a box. Why we add a box in this rigid object? Because it's a movable object. Uh, the, sometimes the robot doesn't know, you know, the difference between the wall and the, and the door. So we told the, the, the robot, yeah, this object can be moved. Then we add constraints, we have an axle. Uh, so we add a constraint there to tell the robot it, it moves like this. We're, we're conveying physics now. And then we add another cylinder in the, in the, um, in the door handle. And we are another constraint with all the robot, you know, this is how you move the door handle. This is a very quick motion. It could take us, you know, probably less than a minute. And then uh, we indicate how we want the robot to rotate this handle. We give physics, we give the intention of what we want to do. And then we go ahead and tell the robot, you know, help us do these tasks. It's a very intuitive way to like uh, convey information, but we also want the robot to be smart and, and, and to um, anticipate human suboptimality. Uh, the human is trying to move these two boxes. One is heavier than the other one. Uh, the, the human might say, you know, I, I'm gonna go with the heavier box because maybe the robot cannot do that. But the robot knows that it, you know, the, the human intends to, to carry the big box uh, and wants the robot to go with the small box, but the robot understands that it, it has more strength and it could help better with the, it will be more optimal if he moves the heavier box. So as the human approaches um, the, the box, uh, you have the, the robot taking the big box and then the human is forced to go with the smaller one. And this is how we anticipate human suboptimality, just to make the task more efficient. Finally, this is some technology that I started with, uh, the, the um, Google AR core for mixed reality. Um, we use glasses at the beginning. I'm sorry, we use uh, cell phones because it's just a, a very, um, most people have cell phones. And I was using this technology, as you can see, there's is mixed reality because you have, uh, uh, you use the real world and you, you create like, uh, you know, these holograms and you enter the actual world. And I wanted to create these boxes using that phone. Uh, it was a great technology, AR core, but it's still in, in its infancy. And so it doesn't have a lot of capability and that's what we moved to the Google, uh, to the Microsoft HoloLens. I'm gonna give you an example how this looks like. I'm gonna move a little farther. Let's see. Perfect. So that's how the hologram looks like in the real world. Uh, this is in our, uh, we're in a lab and you're using just your fingers to move this hologram. Um, the hologram, hololens are great because you can actually detect, um, detect uh, uh, the object. So you have this rigid object, which is the, the, the table. And um, uh, the hologram, the hololens detects this, and you can place the, this hologram on top of it, um, and it doesn't go through. And you know, we were just trying to like, you know, create these boxes and move them around, make them bigger and smaller. Um, okay, this is an actual test that we had. Um, uh, this is uh, us. Let me see if it is moving. Yeah. So this is you, yeah, because of COVID, we couldn't do like uh, actual test in the lab. So. Um, uh, we we had this um, we had this um, a robot in simulation trying to move this box. So we move the hologram uh, from the left to the right, uh, and then the the uh, simulation uh, robot arm um, went ahead and did did the task. Perfect. Okay. So um, I want to stop a little bit here and I want to tell you that I didn't know this, uh, but uh, it seems like I have a, a limit on, on this. this. This has never happened to me, but I guess because of the number of people, I never did it with a lot of people. It seems like uh, it might cut me down. Ah, uh, yeah, I have about three minutes for this meeting. Um, and it's only, be, it's all, yeah. Yeah, break. Yeah, yeah, perfect. So we have three minutes. Uh, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna create a new meeting uh, notice and I'm just gonna send this link to Janik. Um, I, I don't think I can, well, uh, probably I can use the same one. Let, let's try the same one. If, if that doesn't work, I'm gonna create a second, a second link. Yeah, so let, let's try it again. But we have three minutes. 
we have three minutes. And so if you want to ask me any questions, this is great. We still have, as I said, um, two minutes and 50 seconds. Oh, let me see if, if there's any questions in the chat. Um, no problem, sir. I guess uh, we can take the question and answer session at the last when the presentation is over. Okay. Okay. Perfect. Yeah. So I, I'm actually moving to a different topic. So this is great. I actually just finished all the uh, robotic assistant and intent and I apologize. I didn't know there was a time limit. If, if I knew that I would have started the presentation right away from the beginning. Uh, but it seems like it's because of the number of people and I don't have like um, uh, the pay version. Obviously they charge you for this stuff. So I apologize. But uh, Zoom is, is a great tool. And I I, I haven't read since type of issues. And so uh, we just, you know, get up, get, get back in and uh, I'll let everybody in. We can wait like five minutes and then we go. Uh, now I'm gonna talk about uh, how to land on an asteroid. It's a different topic and it's completely different research. So you're not really like um, missing anything. It's, I'm gonna move to a different topic. So um, if you want to, we can just like actually leave right now uh, and then just 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 do it. Or I don't know if we should wait. What's uh? Perfect. So I'm gonna go ahead and um, and um, stop the share, uh, and I'm gonna leave the the meeting. Well, I'm gonna let everybody leave, and then I'm gonna leave myself, and we'll re rejoin with the same link. Okay. Do I mean okay? Okay, link.
Yeah, I, I am not sure. I think it's most people, but I can wait a little bit more if you, if you want. Yeah. Yes, sir. We can resume that session. Perfect. Uh, okay. So, if you have any, oh, okay, let me let me meet some some other people. If you have any issues, you know, feel free to to comment in the chat. Um, okay. So, uh, this is an overview of the Hedgehog Hopping Rover uh, on a small solar system. Sorry. Okay. Yeah. So. Uh, um. Yeah, so this is a rover that uh, is a uh, we, we call it headshot. Is it's a it, um, you know a nickname? Uh, is this a cube that can hop in asteroids? It's a way that we're looking into into you know how to explore asteroids. And uh, the faculty advisor for this is Marco Pavone. I'm gonna go into it. So the first question that you might have is, you know, why are we even exploring asteroids? Uh, exploring small solar system bodies. The exploration drivers uh, are first science. We wanna go to these asteroids and understand how our solar system was formed. Um, this could give us clues about, about you know, how the earth was formed, how maybe where we come from. So, so it's very, from the scientific perspective, it's very valuable. There's other entrepreneurs that are looking into, you know, mining asteroids, look for resources, both, you know, minerals like uh, gold, platinum, uh, but also even water. I mean, getting water and this could actually become maybe a station for refueling in, in the future. And so resources are available. Another one is planetary defense. Um, I, I cannot recall exactly when this happened, but I think it's within the last 10 years. Uh, there was a, an asteroid that hit Russia and it really devastated th that area. We are concerned that this could become a, a problem. These asteroids, uh, we, we, we are able to like, you know, detect the big ones, but uh, um, sometimes they come very close to the earth. So, so we don't really have today, we don't have really a measure uh, to, to, you know, uh, move these asteroids out of course, uh, if they are about to collide with the earth. And so um, we, want, we want to have that capability. And obviously, uh, human exploration. We want to explore the space, and then you know, um, going to asteroids or small system bodies, small solar system bodies, like you know, small moons, uh, asteroids, comets. Uh, this is a capability we'd like to have for for um, astronauts to go there. And so the big question is, how would you change the design uh, for low gravity environments? Obviously, this is a rover, uh, the design of a rover that we used to go to Mars. Uh, will you use the same type of rover uh, for for an asteroid? And the question, the, the answer is no. You wouldn't use, you wouldn't design like this. And, and I'm going to show you a video that this explains why. Comets and asteroids are very fascinating places. They may contain building blocks or the remnants of the building blocks of the solar system however to explore. They present a unique set of challenges. There is the low gravity environment, or microgravity as we call it. For example, a person here on Earth would weigh as little as a paperclip on the surface of a comet. So a rover like Curiosity, which is currently exploring Mars, would actually only weigh a couple of kilograms. It wouldn't be able to generate much traction. And in fact, as it turns its wheels, it would probably just push itself away from the surface. It's actually quite likely to end up rotating and landing upside down, at which point it's ended the mission for the rover. So instead, together, JPL and Stanford have been working on a totally different rover concept that is well suited to these environments called Hedgehog. Instead of rolling around on wheels, the Hedgehog design actually puts three flywheels on the inside of a cube. 
by spinning these flywheels up very slowly and then very quickly applying a brake which transfers all the momentum from the flywheels, we're able to cause the hedgehog to either hop or tumble or perform small adjustments. And so at the end, uh, I want you to notice uh, this is this is uh, researchers in a fly, uh, in a parabolic flight, um, and, and the bomb bomb comet they call it at NASA, and they're actually doing you know uh, this they, they get this minute to do um, of, of microgravity, and so they are actually doing experiments of these uh, hedgehog to, to demonstrate that it to actually hop. you know can jump in low in zero g, um, and it can it can perform those tasks, and so. Um, that's an example. Obviously, we want to create a mission architecture that allows systematic and also affordable. I mean, these robots are not that big. Uh, to do in situ exploration of small system bodies. So this is this is typically how maybe a robot would look like if we explore an asteroid. Um, and you want to have a mother spacecraft that obviously communicates with these uh, little robots. And you want to have long range, long range shopping, you know, tumbling and do, you know, targeted science measurements, maybe get some samples. And as I said, he uses three flywheels to, to create this motion. Okay, uh, so the goal is to have uh, multiple of them, you know, make them go explore the asteroid uh, and then uh, return to like, you know, maybe a place where the mothership could pick them up uh, and, and, and take measurements as they go. Uh, these colors that you see of these comets, um, indicate the gravity uh, that you experience at that comet. The gravity is pretty low. It depends on which body where it's very valo uh, variable depending on the uh, on the mass of the of the of the smaller solar system body. Uh, but it's variable. Uh, in the Earth we also have a, a variable gravity and uh, and the colors indicate that. Um, I think where the the center of mass of the object is, is is more concentrated, that's where you have higher levels of gravity. And obviously, as you move along, uh, the gravity decreases. And so we want to do path planning and trajectory control with multiple robots. Um, and asteroids, you know, present uh, as I said, gr uh, variable gravities. One of the big issues is is the bouncing, right? So when when you jump and you come back to the asteroid, you you essentially hit the asteroid, and if you bounce and you hit with too much force, it's it's it's, it's uh, it could happen that you you actually leave the asteroid because the gravity is very low. Uh, we're talking about like 0.5 meters per second square or less, and so it's almost like zero g, but not really. And this is a demonstration of how it looks like. No, oh, sorry. It's a very small jump, but if you do do that jump in, it's you know maybe less than a centimeter that it goes up. But if you do that jump in a low gravity environment, uh, this could be uh, probably like a you know ten meter jump, because obviously there is very low gravity. And and the concept is you know spin spin up the flywheels, hit the brakes. This generates a large torque. Torque that torque is then transferred as angular momentum to the chassis, and then the rover hops in a forward forward ballistic trajectory. I did a little bit of research in this area, and um, the goal was trying to, you know, tackle that bouncing problem, right? So you have a robot that can move, it can transport itself in the asteroid, but what what happens when it hits the surface? Uh, we wanted to create, a, we wanted to combine this uh, a rover with a um, tensegrity structure, uh, and this tensegrity structure will be, will be like an exoskeleton that would take the 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 impact uh, and it would absorb that kin kinetic energy uh, and then release it slowly after uh, the, the, the um, rover, um, you know, hits the floor. And so, yes, I said, and, and my objective was, you know, investigate this in dynamic simulation. Uh, so a lot of my work was in simulation uh, and then demonstrate that, you know, we could have control mobility in this hybrid robot. So that was another issue. If you had all these ex exoskeleton, can you still have control mobility? And then demonstrate that the insecurous ex exoskeleton actually enhances the ability to absorb this, uh, uh, this large amount of impact energy, right? And so I started obviously with a cube in my simulation environment. And then I created something like, uh, 
a box inside of a box and you had these cables and then I move towards the tensegrity structure, which is this complex structure that, that really looks like a bounce ball. So if you hit this, it deforms the tensegrity, but it actually comes back to, um, to, to its original shape. And I, I just try different concepts until I get to, to the final one. And this is how it looks like. I apologize for this uh, right video. It is not working, but, but this is how it looks like in reality. This is a video from, from Berkeley. And as you can see, as you hit the floor with one G of gravity, uh, it's able to like, you know, take some of this impact energy. And that's what we wanted to do. See in simulation, you can, you can actually see a similar behavior in the simulation. I apologize, the, uh, the video did not very work very well, but they, they, they display similar behavior. And this is a, what I was trying to do here was like uh, emulate the 360 um, escape maneuver uh, if you get stuck in a crater or something, uh, you could use this escape maneuver. And, and this was, uh, you know, in the real world, how it works. I did the same in the simulation environment, and they look pretty similar. Okay, yeah. And so, in conclusion, the headshot and security concept requires active dampening. So, that was uh, what you saw in the Berkeley experiment. Um, was uh, passive, so you just hit the floor and then it, it passively, you know, absorbs this energy. Uh, I, I believe we need it with more active so, so that the cables move in certain configuration as they absorb kinetic energy post impact. Uh, NTRT was the simulation environment that I use, uh, and it realistically, you know, demonstrates that you could do simulation, um, you can do realistic simulations, and uh, because later we did experiments in the actual in, in an actual test bed. And they, you know, the, the results were pretty similar. And then for the simulation efforts, as well experimentation in microgravity test bits is required to, to, to provide a proper assessment to see if this is actually feasible. Okay, so um, I'm gonna leave the questions to the end. I'm gonna move to a different project. This was one of my final perks uh, as a master's student. We were looking into um, uh, how we could, um, grab a satellite, uh, specifically a uh, Saturn V, uh, I'm sorry, Saturn V, a, um, a SpaceX uh, Dragon capsule. This is, I think, a cargo capsule. Uh, and we were looking to, you know, how do you use a humanoid to actually, you know, grab this type of uh, object in space? So the objective, again, is intercept and ca catch a rock satellite. Uh, some applications could be like onboarding servicing. So uh, if you wanted to like refuel a satellite, uh, you could use this method, uh, removing inactive debris satellites. So if there's uh, satellites that you want to remove from orbit, you could use this method. And also saving, uh, saving lost uh, commercial crew astronauts. So if, if they were able, they were like, you know, they, they got off course, they cannot land on earth. Maybe this is a way to retrieve them to maybe ISS. And so space control, I'm, I'm a controls engineer. So um, I want to talk a little bit about uh, the, um, the um the uh sorry um the controllers so you have the joint task controller uh, and this allows you to control the joints of every single uh degree of freedom of the robot and we use this for navigation so this robot uh, the ocean robot that you see here has 20 degrees of freedom we use the joint task controller for both navigation and rendezvous toward the moving satellite and then we use posori Position and orientation, uh, position and orientation controller, and I joint task. Go ahead. Okay, Posor, position and orientation controller and the joint task controllers to actually capture the satellite. Uh, we had a camera sensor uh, that we use as feedback, so we wanted to have uh, live feedback of the satellite and use that information to actually, you know, run the with it with the satellite. On the right picture, you actually this this picture of the astronauts is I just we I would just kind of like Photoshop it, but um, the the right picture that you see here that's a real picture of the Ocean One. The Ocean One is called Ocean One because we actually use this robot to go under on, underwater, um, and I I repurpose the, the robot to use it in space. So I I told to my risk, uh, research advisor I was like you know can I can I actually do this for for space, uh, and and he was like yeah this, this is a great idea because the, the, the environments are similar. You know, you're far away from Earth. Uh, you have a lot of pressure um, and uh, you're a very like uh, isolated place. Um, and you can move in obviously six degrees to freedom. 
All right, so some of the challenges was obviously microgravity uh, in the simulation environment we use, uh, you could simulate microgravity. And once you start moving with a robot, it was pretty, it could get pretty crazy pretty quickly. Um, if you start like moving one joint very fast, it just kept ro rotating. Uh, and so that was, uh, that was a challenge. Uh, obviously 20, controlling 20 degrees of freedom at the same time is, is a quite challenging task. You have six degrees of, of freedom in the body. So you have X, Y, Z, and also rotating in the pitch jaw wall. Uh, and also every arm of the robot has a seven degree of freedom. It's seven degrees of freedom. So you, you have 20 degrees of freedom total. Uh, and then uh, we did this through COVID. So we couldn't actually work with the actual hardware and we had to do everything in simulation. And obviously, you know, moving 20 degrees of freedom, sending uh, control to these joints in just software in a simulation environment was very uh, both software and hardware intensive. So we had some issues uh, with this load rendering. And then, uh, you know, more technical problems was like competing controller objectives, or, you know, the controller wanted to navigate, but also, you know, keep the robot stable. And so sometimes they will compete and, and attack each other. And then the sequencing, the sequencing was very key uh, to actually get to do this task, you know, uh, get to the satellite and then start the, you know, grabbing maneuver and then uh, go. So I'm going to give you an example of what we did, uh, final demo. Well, I'm going to give you an example of what happened at the beginning, what didn't work. So this is us, you know, approaching the moving satellite. We're getting there a little faster than the satellite. And then we go too far. We actually collide with the satellite and the satellite just keeps, you know, going away. So it's just a part of engineering, I think. Uh, engineering um, uh, can, it's not easy. And so it's, it, it's a little trial and error, I guess. Uh, you wouldn't like to do this in space. And this other one, uh, we actually got to the satellite. This is a non-moving satellite. Uh, we get to the to the right position, we adjust, and then we go for the grab. Um, I don't think this video displays it. We don't get to that part, but um, we actually try to grab the satellite, and it actually we lose it. We grab it in in, in another right way, and we lose lose it. But I think I cut the the the, the video too too soon. Okay, so this is aggressive grasping. We get very fast to the satellite and when we hit it, obviously this is super in control. We actually hit the satellite. In, real, in the real world, we would have damaged the satellite. And so this is not the approach that we would like to follow, um, uh, but we were able to grab it. <laughs> so, so that was good, but um, too, too aggressive. Uh, we need to go slower and try not to collide with, it, with the satellite. In the next one where, you know, catching up to the satellite, in its orbit, uh, where we get close to it. And once we get that, we use the camera sensor to, you know, just keep track of the satellite. And then uh, we we start, you know, doing this like hugging motion to actually um, uh, go ahead and, and grab the satellite without getting too close. And, um, and there you have it. We actually got to do control grabbing of this satellite. Um, and now I wanna talk about, uh, you know, there's some, some things that you would say, you know, uh, why don't you have a grabbing fixture and stuff? So, so I'm gonna talk about that a little bit. And with this all in simulation. So, uh, okay, so this proposed timeline, no. Uh, future work, we wanna integrate the nav and man manipulation control. So we have two different controllers for this mission. One that did the rendezvous and another one that did the grab and we have to run them um, separately because they, they would compete with each other. And so um, uh, we, we thought about, you know, just integrating them and just have a single control, a single controller script that would do everything. Um, we wanted to change the initial conditions, you know, where you start the, the, the robot, maybe in front of the satellite or just having a different position. So it, it rendezvous, it goes around, I guess. And then uh, we wanted to cut a grasping fixture. We didn't have enough time. So instead of just grabbing the actual, you know, uh, satellite, you could have like a grabbing fixture and that would be more realistic so that the, the arms could, could grab to that. Um, and we would like to do maybe serving, servicing tasks, maybe uh, putting um, fuel into the, into the satellite, maybe add some force sensor feedback. And then, uh, I mean, the goal is to test on an actual ocean one, go into a pool, maybe at the university and have, um, have a, uh, a mock-up satellite and do the whole mission, you know, underwater. Uh, to just test uh, the feasibility of this. 
I want to talk about uh, talk about uh, uh, a little bit of the outreach and involvement that I have had. Um, uh, this is me in the mission control room at, at NASA, um, and then um, I got to see a SpaceX launch back in 2016. I have been in the vehicle assembly building where they put the rockets together. I got to the KSC uh, and and got to you know interact with other uh, NASA employees. And um, I have been doing a lot of outreach in the US, in Mexico, and now even India. <laughs> so I'm, I'm, you know, I'm always trying to like, you know, push and, and discuss uh, what NASA is doing and, and, and uh, share science with, with other people. Um, some other opportunities I have had, I have gone to JPL and I got to see the Curiosity Revolver mock-up they have. Well, it's, a, it's not really a mock-up, it's a, it's a replica uh, where they do a lot of tests. Uh, I got to go to SpaceX where I got to see, you know, the, the factor of Elon Musk, I didn't get to see him, but um, I got to see where they develop all the products. Um, I met with the NASA administrator, this is me in the back. There was a lot of people that day, but I got to meet him. And uh, I have done, I, I love Taekwondo. And uh, surprisingly, uh, one day I got to um, just uh, do Taekwondo at NASA in their gym. And I met an astronaut and the astronaut ha happened to be, uh, you know, Stanley Love. Uh, he's the instructor of the Taekwondo. So <laughs> through that, I got to meet an astronaut. Um, these are the new commercial crew vehicles uh, brought to NASA um, during the announcement of, you know, the, the, the mission that you saw this year. Uh, I, I was there last year with, where they announced the astronauts that were going to do it. And, and they brought the two vehicles. Um, I want to show you this example. This is a me uh, getting into Argos. Argos is a machine, a robot that um, does control and allows you to experience microgravity on Earth. Uh, and so uh, it's essentially a crane that follows you around and uh, it always um, pulls you uh, 1G up so that you all, you're always balanced and you can feel some of how microgravity feels like. That beeping is, is not good. <laughs> I was going too fast. Yeah, and as you, you see, you know, I'm, I'm using the rails because if, if I don't grab it, I just like keep moving away from that. So I can to grab this. There, I can grab myself and I'm hooked to, to, to that structure. Right, great. Yeah, so um, I have been able to interact with astronauts. In this picture, you see an actual EBA. I was at JSC uh, doing a little bit of mon monitoring, and I was seeing, you know, an EBA. Uh, my goal was, you know, my, my job was to make sure that the, the, the jetpack didn't hit anything and open accidentally. I have done some, you know, robotics, uh, uh, industrial training. I do outreach, and as I said, I met some, some astronauts like Johnny Kim. This guy is like, um, I guess, a superhero. He's a Navy SEAL medical doctor from Harvard, and also an astronaut. So all the dream, kids' dreams in one person. <laughs> Finally, um, I got to go to the Marshall Space Flight Center. This is where they test the actual rockets. This is the core stage of a SLS, uh, the space launch system that is going to take astronauts to the moon and Mars. Uh, and um, I got to see you know, the, how the computer looks like from the inside, uh, a nuclear propulsion test stand, and they also have an International Space Station uh, Control Center. I want to uh, thank uh, for the Robotic Assistant Project, um, uh, the supervision of Professor Monroe Kennedy. He's my advisor at, at Stanford. I still work with him, even though I'm at NASA. Um, and Richie, Richie is the, one of my collaborators uh, in the mixed reality work. I want to thank uh, for the capturing satellite. Um, I, I have uh, Professor Osama Kati from Stanford, um, Adrian Pedra and William Chung uh, were our teaching assistants. And obviously Daniel and I worked on, on the robot uh, and he's also a graduate researcher. Finally, for, for the supervision and collaboration of the asteroid landing, and you have Professor Marco Pavone from Stanford, uh, the director of the Autonomous Systems Lab. Uh, Dr. Uh, Benjamin Hawkman, at that point, uh, he was still a PhD student. Now he's an employee at NASA JPL. Uh, and also Joe worked in that project as well, is a mechanical engineer from UC Berkeley. Well, so with that, with this, I conclude my talk and um, feel free to ask me any questions.
Okay. So uh, we have done the live YouTube streaming, and from that we have some questions from the participants. So the first question is, what is the material we use for the robotics? As there is the weather change and all the conditions are changed. Uh, what material for which project? For the asteroid one? No, no. In general, for every robotics uh, models. Uh, we we typically try to use. So we have ten more minutes. So I just only have ten 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 minutes for questions. Um. Uh, we typically use aluminum. I think it's a very light material. Uh, composites don't work very well. Like you can use them in space for a short amount of time, but if you want to do long duration, you try to use a very light material because it's very costly. So, so I think uh, in the past I have used aluminum. And obviously, depending on the payload, sometimes you use you know some coatings with gold. Okay. Then the next question is. Uh, what is the mode of communication from here Earth to the uh, robots at that uh, point on the asteroids or uh, outer space? Yeah, uh, I, I, I'm gonna tell you the truth. I am not. Um, I am not a communications engineer, but I'm gonna tell you like what I know of. Uh, we typically when we have like uh, uh, robots very far away, like Mars. I think we use the deep space network. Um, to communicate with the with the probes, right? So in Mars we have a probe, and uh, as I was talking with the asteroids, we will have a mothership. That will, mothership will communicate to Earth, typically using the the deep space network that 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 is uh, developed, and um, and the mothership will talk to the little robots. So that's that's typically how we do things. So you do relay. Okay, so the next question is. Uh... Are we using quantum computing in robotics? Yes, uh, and this this comes when uh, I think uh, it comes for like you know trying to do machine learning. Uh, we, we're trying to explore this area because it allows it would allow us to do computations, uh, you know, intense computations in in in, in less time. Uh, I don't think we're doing it in space at the moment, but we're trying to use it in Earth to make robots uh, be able to make you know. Uh, calculate a lot of pos different possible scenarios and come up with the best solution. And so we're exploring that area. Let me, I have some questions in the chat. So I'm gonna go with that. What about extraterrestrial intelligence? Uh, okay, so uh, for that, okay. And then, okay, that's role of robots searching extraterrestrial intelligence. Yeah, so, so this is something that we're interested in. Um, uh, obviously, you know, with the Venus uh, news that, that Venus that, that we got, you know, that we found an organic compound. We're going to be looking to that. We're also look, uh, excited to explore Europa to try to find out, you know, just life. I mean, it doesn't have to be intelligent, just just a, a sign of life in a different planet, maybe in our solar system. That would be great. But yeah, yeah, I mean, that this is kind of what we're doing with exploration. However, uh, me as a human, uh, you know, I work at the Johnson Space Center where we do human space exploration. I'm a little afraid of, you know, robots not seeing, a, you know, maybe a form of life and not really being able to identify it, right? Because robots are, are smart to a degree, but uh, that's why we want to send humans because I think humans and, and especially scientists could give us, uh, you know, could find, you know, more interesting, uh, uh, maybe uh, clues of life in, in different planets. Okay, so uh, what type of, in which sector do you think NASA should still improve? Obviously cost, I think we're, as a government agency, we, we should be more cost efficient and also fast, fast like industry is doing, like SpaceX probably. We have to copy some of that, um, I guess, speed and urgency that uh, in, in government agencies just typically, don't, you know, you don't have. And so I, I think that, you know, cost and schedule, should be, uh, you know, approach and obviously safety, obviously safety, cost and schedule. Those three things should be improved, I think, in my in my perspective, personal perspective. Uh, but I don't speak in behalf of NASA. Okay, so uh, are there any defense mechanisms to protect sat uh, satellites from solar wind? Uh, I have heard about solar wind. I am I am exactly not sure, but yeah, radiation is one of the big issues that we have. Um, 
I, I have not worked a lot in that area, so I cannot give you a, a definite answer, but I, I assume so. I think they, they subject a lot of the electrical components to like even nuclear radiation on Earth just to make sure that they are flight certified, right? The certification to send things to space is very rigorous to avoid these type of things. Will the camera be small? Big? What type of camera do you use for the rovers? Um, I think that's something that we haven't discussed. I, I don't think we have talked a lot about the instruments, but actually the planification and what type of algorithms we would use to actually just move, right? Uh, obviously the payload is very important, but that, that's really more of the job of, of scientists. You know, what payloads do we take? What instruments do we take? What type of measurements we do? And that's, I think that's more of the scientist's work. Uh, me as an engineer is like, how do I do it? How do I get there and how do I explore? Uh, is there any use of gold foils for robotics purpose? I, I have seen it. I don't know if they do it so it looks good uh, or it actually is to, you know, avoid maybe radiation or deflect, uh, uh, you know, heat. Um, but I have used it. Like Robonat uses a very, you know, gold-like uh, structure. And, and I don't know if it is just to make it look good or, or, or if, 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 if it has an, an actual purpose. Okay, so um, at what extent CAD and CA uh, are helpful in modeling robotics? I, I, I mean, we do a lot of, the work in CAT, right? So uh, before you build it, you, you CAT it. Uh, can robots be brought back from the planets back to Earth? I think you have to have like an, a specific mission uh, for these small ones. I mean, it's possible. You just have to have a, you know, a deploy mechanism that brings them back. I, I, I don't think for the rovers in Mars, that was like the plan, but uh, yeah, maybe in the, if we're trying to do some, retrieve some samples, uh, I think that, that should be, that, that, could ha that could happen. And that's a mechanism that you have to also develop. Comments about humans in Mars. Okay. Yeah, I'm trying. Humans in Mars, I mean, we're shooting for 30, 20, 20, 34, 35, but we wanna go to the moon because if we cannot live on the moon, uh, we, we cannot live in Mars. <laughs> and so we're using the moon to as a test bed and maybe even as a refueling, um, as a refueling uh, station. Can we control the rovers live with video streaming? Uh, so going back to to uh, the issue, uh, it's a very far distance, and so we have a very um, very uh, limited uh, communicate. Like there's delays just to communicate information, uh, and you don't have really like these speeds that you have on Earth with with the internet, right? So uh, it's a it's a little harder, um, and you have to have obviously like uh, communication satellites that that can do that, and so you have to create like this network. To, to be able to do that like real, real time. But there is a big delay between the communication between here and Mars. And obviously as the planet moves away from Earth, the communication changes. And so it's all, it's all about signal, I think. That's a, it's a communication issue. And so we, wanna, we're not, we want actually robots to be more autonomous so that they don't have to have as much reliance on humans. Yeah, yeah, I, I, I'm very excited about um, the India space program, right? Um, uh, it's been it's been great. Uh, you know, I follow it because uh, it's very, very super cost effective, and and I think a lot of companies in the US are getting a little scared, right? Because uh, I mean, this is my perspective, personal, um, because the cost is way the quality is amazing, and, and the cost is way way lower, and so. Um, it just makes it competitive, right? Um, I think uh, a lot of U.S. companies that want to like send communication satellites are looking to the Indian Space Agency because the cost is way lower. And so, um, you know, keep it going. I mean, this is great. This helps. Competition is good. Uh, I think it allow Russia, NASA, and a lot of other space agencies to to do better. Obviously, we're yeah. So that's that's what I can say. So this is gonna get disconnected in about one minute. Um, if that happens, I just wanna say thanks so much for this opportunity. It, it's been great to talk to you. Uh, you know, feel free to reach out. Uh, I'm on Facebook. Inst
perfect. Thank 